Um, thanks. Uh, my name is Philip. I'm a web developer, independent contractor, slash freelancer. Um, this is the last talk for today, so I'll try to keep it lighter than usual, not so hardcore. And it's a technical talk. Um, so let's start. Basically, React is a library for building user interfaces. Um, it was released by Facebook in 2011. Uh, it started as a web library, but now you can use it for building mobile use also. So mobile UIs and mobile applications. Uh, but in order to understand why React was built, the way it was built, and what problems it solves uh, on the web, we need to get a perspective of what major issues do we face when we build UIs for the web. Um, when the web was developing back in the 90s, pages were very simple. So basically, no AJAX calls, no dynamic UIs. Um, when something changed on the page, basically everything was free vendors from the beginning, from the start. And when JavaScript was introduced, if there was any JavaScript on the page, it was very, very simple. Uh, fast forward to 2015. Um, Front-end development is now officially an engineering field because it's not so easy to start a front-end uh, project anymore. You have a lot of decisions to make. Uh, and building good, good web applications uh, requires entire teams of people. It's very difficult to build a, web app, a good web app alone. <clears throat> and because of all these advancements, companies like Google have poured in a lot of money into research and development and have made um, uh, basically now, because of that, we have fast JavaScript engines. So JavaScript has become much faster than it used to be. Uh, however, we still have a large margin between uh, native performance and web app performance. Um, and the, the modern frameworks that we have today, like Angular, uh, make this thing, make your job even harder, uh, because they use the DOM recklessly and they have two-way data binding and so on. So when we inspect the problem, when we see uh, where the bottlenecks are, it's not usually JavaScript, but it's the way uh, we use the DOM, because the DOM was not really made for dynamic UIs. It was initially designed for static pages. Uh, just to give you an idea um, what are the most expensive uh, operations in the DOM, you as a developer don't really have much control over them, uh, but preflows and beam paints are quite expensive, and if you are reckless and careless, uh, you'll get to trigger them very often. Uh, so this is where React comes in. So as I said, it's, a, it's only a view library, and if there's one thing that makes React so well accepted among developers, it's the fact that it makes you write these components, uh, which are encapsulated, and then you can compose these components very easily to create complex ones out of uh, simple ones. Uh, React uses one-way binding, um, and we'll see why that's so. That's contrary to the popular trend now. And instead of writing directly to the DOM, um, instead of updating the DOM directly, it, uh, internally it maintains a virtual DOM. Uh, so React components, you can think of them as state machines. Um, each React component has internal state, and it has so-called properties, which are uh, ways that components communicate uh, with each other. Um, you can nest components, so basically you can build this component tree out of them, and they are written entirely in JavaScript. Um, in addition to the JavaScript, you can also use something called JSX, which is an extension to JavaScript that allows you to mix um, HTML in JavaScript. Um, when, you, when you first hear about it, it sounds like a really bad idea, but once you get used to it, it makes your code much, much more readable. Um, so let's see what React components look like. Uh, this, let me see the font. Um, this is uh, React, this is JavaScript, this is JXX code basically. Um, this is how you write components in React. And what I have done here, I have recreated um, the widget here on the left in React. So I've said that the widget here, that's a component that's in turn uh, comprised out of two different components namely the, the title and the input element. Uh, so here is the title at the top. That's one React component. Uh, the most important method a component has is the vendor method, and it basically describes what your component is going to look like. Uh, then we have so the, the, the title. Um, that's just a hard-coded string wrapped in an H2 tag. 
And then the input, um, the, the input element is also a React component, which is an input um, element wrapped in a div tag. And now here in the form component, um, in the render method, I'm basically saying, okay, well, my form component is composed out of the title and the text input. Uh, so that's it. Using, basically using JSX only, you can, um, using this syntax, you can write um, static pages now. Um, you can see that the text here is hard coded. If you want to, if you want to make it dynamic, uh, what we can do is we can use uh, component properties. So if you look at here in the form component, I've declared a variable called title, and now uh, I can pass in this variable inside the title component, so I'm binding it uh, one way. And now that it is bound, it's passed in as a parameter, I can use it here as a property. Um, uh, and whenever the title here change, actually, no, sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, one more thing that I would like to do is um, I would like to capture the input here, so the, the, the text uh, that's going, that the user is going to enter. And in order to, I would like to save it somewhere in some state. And in order to do that, I'm going to introduce a component state. Uh, and I'll introduce the state in the form component because in React, it's advisable to uh, keep the state as high as possible in the component hierarchy. Um, so here, I'm going to initialize my state to some value, uh, and I'm going to write a change handler. Because we have one-way binding, we have to react to events. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, declaring, I'm implementing a uh, change handler that's just going to set the new state uh, of my variable. And now that I have those two, I can pass in uh, the value that I want to display, and uh, I can pass in the change handler. And then here on the top, similarly, they are also uh, bound one way. Uh, so this is, the, this is the component that we have. We have the form component, which has two children, the text input and the title. And we have these properties that are passed in from the parent to the children. Uh, whenever the state um, of the form component changes, um, the whole tree is going to be re-rendered. And even though that looks like a very dumb idea, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty fast. We'll see later why. Um, so React uses one-way binding, and that's, uh, that's not really a popular thing, uh, but it's, it is becoming, and it will be more and more popular in the future. Uh, even Amber is starting to introduce one-way binding as a default binding. Uh, the reason why that's so, um, with one with two-way binding, um, two-way binding is practical and it's um, it's a good technique to get something really fast to bind your view to your models. But two-way binding has uh, problems such as updating a value might trigger additional updates, cascading updates that are difficult to debug um, and they are difficult to profile because it's not your code that's doing the updates; is the is the framework. And one-way binding, uh, it gives you more control, um, and it's much better for performance. So now, um, as I said, whenever the state of a component changes, um, the entire component is going to be re-rendered. Um, you can control that, that workflow up to an extent. You can say, you can implement, each component can implement the should component update method. And this is a method that just returns true or false based on um, whether the should component should get updated or not. So just to il illustrate this, let's say that we have this component tree and we call set state here at the top. Well, let's say that the red component uh, decides not to update itself. The green components, meaning the children, will also not update themselves, and these components will. Uh, in this way, you can prune and cut the component tree easily, and um, that way you can speed up the, your, the rendering of your application. <clears throat> one, actually, one, it's, it's one concept that plays really well with React um, is immutability, and libraries that provide immutability, like immutable.js, uh, can also give you a performance boost. Basically, when you have immutability and immutable collections, uh, whatever change you do to the, to the collection will return a new collection. Uh, and 
Because of that, you can easily compare collections uh, just by comparing references. And in JavaScript, that can be done using the triple equality sign. So the should component update method becomes uh, trivial. You, you only, so making optimizations also becomes trivial because you, also, you only use the triple equality sign. Um, now, I've mentioned the virtual DOM. Um, when React, when you call set state, when React makes changes, it doesn't flush those changes directly to the DOM. Um, it uses a concept called, it, it uses an internal implementation uh, called a virtual DOM, which is an abstraction between your application and the real DOM or the browser. Now, the virtual DOM makes everything faster, but there are also additional implications of using a virtual DOM, and that is your application is not, is not dependent on the browser. You're not really writing a uh, web-specific application. You're writing an application uh, which is isolated. That allows you to test your app easily, and that also allows you to compile your app for a different platform or render it easily on the server because you don't have this dependency. Uh, and just to give you an idea how much simpler the virtual DOM is, uh, first take a look at this mess here. These are the first level properties of an empty div node um, in, the, in the real proper DOM. There are about 100 of them. So this, these are the, just, just the first level properties without following the prototype chain. Uh, and there are some really silly ones, like on volume change and on time update, uh, on cam play and base URI. <clears throat> uh, and these here are the first level properties of a virtual DOM uh, div node. So there are only six of them, and they can be easily serialized because there are no circular dependencies. Uh, what makes the virtual DOM fast uh, is a efficient diffing algorithm, which basically compares your old DOM to your new DOM. Um, and in addition to creating that diff, uh, the virtual DOM can batch changes uh, and create a big patch uh, that can efficiently update a subtree in your DOM. So basically, um, whatever changes you make to your components are diffed and batched, and then you get an efficient patch that get, gets applied to the real DOM. <clears throat> so because of, the, because of this abstraction, testing is very easy. Uh, plus, code is modularized. You are forced to write components, um, which is always good. Uh, there's one helper in React that provides all, you, basically 90% of what you need to test components. Uh, there are two, um, two techniques that you, you can use for testing. Uh, one of them is shallow rendering. Uh, shallow rendering basically just renders the uh, component without rendering the children, uh, and that's very useful for unit testing because you want to test, with unit testing, you want to test components in isolation. And if you want to do deeper tests, like uh, uh, you want to test entire subtrees or um, bigger components, complex components, uh, you can use something called JS DOM, uh, which is just an implementation of the DOM in JavaScript. Um, we were also supposed to have a talk about React Native. Uh, unfortunately, it got canceled, so I decided to also give you an overview of what React Native is and, and why you should care. Uh, about one or two years ago, uh, when web developers wanted to develop a mobile application, they would resort to something like uh, Apache Cordova or Titanium or any other tool that somehow allowed you to wrap your um, web application inside a container running on mobile. Now, React Native, even though it looks like something like that, is completely different because it allows you to write uh, native mobile applications in JavaScript. That means you get native uh, views, and your JavaScript code is, is executed natively on the platform that you are targeting. Uh, the, the entire layout is basically running in a separate thread. Uh, that means no, you, you, won't lost any, you won't lose any frames, 
and uh, performance is much much better than uh, uh, than the, the other uh, than the competitors. So this is basically how the architecture looks like. Uh, we have the UI thread that's running the layout, and here this here uh, JavaScript core, for instance, that's the uh, JavaScript engine running in Safari, and also you have access to it on iOS. So these two threads, basically this has the higher priority because that way you get better user experience. Um, and these two threads communi communicate asynchronously. And the way you write the code is basically the same way that you write components for the web. Um, a, span, a span, for example, uh, becomes a text. These components, so text is provided by React, by Facebook, um, and div also becomes view, and so on. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, React is a view library that's very simple to use, it's fast, um, it's testable, and it's very flexible. Thanks. Questions? Please raise your hand. Hi. Uh, how well does the Flux architecture fit into the React Native story? Okay. Um, so the question is, how does Flux fit into everything? Um, so React, being only a view library, needs something around it to, for you to build an actual application with uh, good practices. Um, Flux is a pattern, so it's not a library or, or architecture or anything, it's just a pattern that allows you to, um, that, that plays well with React because it's also uh, provides, it provides this one-way data flow, uh, which, is, which is what React uses. Um, so um, I'm not sure what, what exactly, what, would, you, would you like some details about it or? Yeah. Uh how, how would one do uh, like, you know, actions and dispatcher in React Native? Would, would it just pay, follow the same pattern as for, you know, uh, Reflux or Flux or libraries, but mm -hmm. for the native code? Oh, for the native code? Yeah. Um, yes, you could, uh, even though, yes, you could. That, and that's also a good idea. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand that it was about React Native. Uh, that's also a good idea to just, because um, nothing is really changing on the native platform. All the principles remain the same, it's just that you are swapping components. Instead of divs, you are using uh, components provided by React Native. So yes, it's, it's, it's a good idea to use Flux. Reflux, for example, is a really nice implementation. More questions? We have to get recorded. Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering, if I decide to use, uh, to make a React Native app, instead of using Objective-C and making a native one on iOS, do you still need to know it? Or can I just uh, use JavaScript and forget Objective-C forever? Uh, you can just use JavaScript. You don't have to write any components to tie it to Objective-C or? If, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if you are missing some components, you can write you can write them yourself, um, but if you, but the basic toolkit that React Native has uh, is almost enough for you to write a, uh, an application completely in JavaScript, because you do have this engine that runs your JavaScript, um, and you do have this uh, this um, thread that runs your views, which are already implemented. So. Basically, you have 90% of what you, what you will probably need. Hi. Um, I have a question about the JSX files. Uh -huh. You mentioned that you can um, combine JavaScript with HTML. Uh -huh. 
So how does that work? Is it like uh, parsed in uh, during runtime or transpiled beforehand or? Yes, that's a good question, thanks. Uh, uh, you can do both. You can include a JS file in your head uh, node. Let me just go back. Um, and that's going to, yes, so you can do it in the browser. There's a JSX transformer that runs in the browser. Uh, that's uh, not advisable for production because it slows down your rendering. Or you can do it, you can do it uh, before. You can compile and together with your minification process, you can get the distributable and then use that file. So you can do both. 